Hello and welcome to MF Corner. I'm Sonal Bhutra in the Mumbai studio. And today we talk about a very interesting category, the Balanced Advantage Funds, which is a kind of a hybrid fund, invests primarily into debt and equity. What are these funds? Whose portfolio should it be a part of? What happens when there's volatility? Is it a no for some of the investors? Can you do a lump sum or is it SIP? To dwell on this, we have with us Kushal Bhagi, the owner at PCC Investing. Kushal, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining in today. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of conversation around this but sometimes it's very difficult to understand this category as well uh, sometimes uh, you want to give us a quick introduction to balance advantage funds as we kick off the show yes of course good afternoon Sonam, and good afternoon to your viewers as well so as you mentioned balance advantage and dynamic asset allocation and we'll use these two words interchangeably for now they're kind of a hybrid fund which as the name suggests they use a combination of asset classes dead equity and gold and other commodities as well. But the overarching purpose of hybrid funds has been to reduce volatility because that allows investors to remain invested for longer periods more easily, right? Because the drawdown in pure equity funds can be quite high. Now, if you look at the SEBI classification for hybrid funds, there are various types and each of them have fairly defined rules. So for example, you have conservative hybrid funds. They can invest only 10 to 25% in equity or aggressive hybrid funds where the equity exposure can be around 65 to 80%, multi-asset funds, which should have at least 10% and a minimum three asset classes. And then you have BAF and DAF funds. These funds play primarily between equity and debt, but there are no restrictions. So the fund manager has the leeway to vary the equity exposure all the way from zero to 100. So you can think of BAF funds as, you know, funds that are at times aggressive, at times moderate, and at times conservative. So the output of these BAF funds is an equity to debt ratio. So the fund manager can either keep the equity to debt ratio at let's say 70, 30, or when markets are perceived to be very risky, they can lower and rebalance the portfolio to make it 30, 70. And it's this dynamism or this flexibility that has struck a chord with investors. Okay, so you know, you talk about this appeal factor. Let's elaborate on that because BAF funds not so long ago got a bad name for being missold by some of the elements within the industry, right? They were called monthly income products as well. The truth is that these funds do have sizable equity as well. When markets go south, uh, there were some issues around payments as well. It was a dampener for many investors. So can you explain that appeal factor? Can you try and understand what does it exactly entail? Very true. And you know, a few things have happened over the last five years that have changed the outlook for these kinds of funds. Today, there is some sort of consensus in terms of what you can expect when you invest in a BAF. And that proposition is that when markets are falling, they will fall less than pure equity funds. When markets are rising, they will deliver or have the potential to deliver debt plus plus returns. Okay, so if you look at the returns over the last three years, for example, um, a Nifty index fund, a Nifty 50 index fund would have given you a return of around 17.5% CAGR. And an ICICI BAF or an Edelweiss BAF, I'm picking these two BAFs because they're amongst the four or five BAFs that have a you know 15 year track record. Their returns are in the 14% category. But their standard deviation or the volatility is almost half. Okay, even if you look at rolling returns, you know, five year rolling returns data since 2012. The Nifty 50 has given you around 12.8, but these balance advantage funds are only a couple of percentage points behind. So the point I'm making is that when funds behave as per the stated design, that gives a lot of confidence to investors. And when you add to that what's happening in the recent past, you know, so much of investor awareness and education that have supported this campaign and, you know, supported this narrative of reasonable returns with lesser volatility, that can be a very appealing proposition. Okay, so then in that case, who should it be appealing for or who would it be appealing for? Which category of investors should be looking at this? So straight away, if you have lump sum money to deploy and if you're confused about whether it's a good time or not to invest in the market, like today, you know, many people are concerned a little bit that valuations have increased quite a bit and what happens if you invest and the market goes down? So people then tend to postpone their investment decision. And as we've seen in the recent past, markets kept going up and then they find themselves in a very awkward position. So in these cases, balance advantage funds are a very good choice. A BAF with 60% equity exposure today means if you invest rupees 100, 60 rupees is only going into equity, 40 rupees is actually going into debt. Mm. So the biggest advantage of balance advantage funds is that it takes the timing out of the investor's hands, okay? It's also good for new investors. 
for new investors, if the initial experience of investing is good, which means basically you're making money, or conversely, if markets are falling and you're losing less money than the market, right? So that's also a good experience. These outcomes build your confidence, which allow you to remain invested for longer periods, which traditionally we've seen people struggle to remain invested for two and even three years' time. So BAF could be a good entry point for these people as well. Okay. Finally, so people who are retired and, you know, if somebody wants to do an SWP, I've seen a lot of people use BAF funds for this purpose also. Okay, all right. So this could be the category if you have lumps and just go for it. And as you explained, it's mostly in equity and debt and it changes according to the market cycle that you're in. And, as, and that's, of course, a big positive for this particular category. So, you know, when we speak about mutual funds, one thing that happened in this budget was a lot of changes when it comes to taxation rates and so much so that it got confusing to a level as well. So with the recent changes in taxation budgets, how tax friendly are balanced advantage, advantage funds in that case? Very, very tax friendly. Mm -hmm. You know, to qualify for equity taxation, a scheme needs 65% and above in equity. Most BAF funds in the industry today fit this requirement. Not all, but most. Okay. All right. Looks like there is. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Kushal. I think we have you back. Okay. I said a balanced advantage fund has around 60% net equity exposure. Uh, what does that actually mean, right? So, for example, 80% in equity and 20% in debt. That might be what a BAF scheme, what the fund manager is invested in. But if you want to keep your net equity exposure at 60%, then 20% they can use either arbitrage funds or even derivatives to bring down the net equity exposure. So in that case, you'll have 80% in equity, so you get equity tax. And even if you look at the debt component, you know, 20% which is in debt, you actually get a very favorable tax rate because if you were to unbundle and invest in equity separate and debt separate, your debt component would be taxed at your tax slab. But over here, because it's part of a balanced advantage product, you get taxed only at equity. So 12 and a half and 20% is what you get taxed at. So what's happening now is you see a lot of investors strategically using balanced advantage funds to achieve an optimum asset allocation in their portfolio. Hmm. Okay, so very tax friendly and that is something that any investor would like because it's just not about returns, it's post-tax returns at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. Uh, Kushal, it's a very interesting chat but we have to get into a quick commercial break. On the other side, we'll continue our discussion with Kushal Bhagi on balanced advantage funds. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. You're still tuned into MF Corner. We still have with us Kushal Bhagi of PCC Investing. We are understanding everything. It's a deep dive into balanced advantage funds. Kushal, uh, we spoke about who it is beneficial for. You said if somebody has lump sum money, just go ahead and invest here. But does that mean these funds are not suited so much for somebody who wants to invest here via SIPs? See, today, Sonal, most paths actually vary their equity exposure between 30 and 70%. So for me, that's a bit too conservative because, you know, long-term SIP strategy is a very slow strategy. You need a lot of time for your money to actually compound. So I would say if you have an SIP strategy, your choice of fund should be quite aggressive. If you want to pick a hybrid fund, I think aggressive hybrid funds is a good pick. Or if you actually want to go and invest SIP into a BAF, you need to pick a really aggressive BAF. Of course, depending on your goals, your time period, what it is that you want out of the investment, there could be some cases where an SIP into BAF can be a viable option also. But typically, if you pick BAF, it should be an aggressive BAF. Okay, all right. Aggressive BAF is where you should go about it because with the longer term, that's where if you do an SIP, that would mean more uh, investments in equity portion, right? So, say, if you've picked an aggressive BAF, what would that mean? Um, aren't these schemes largely similar to, say, a conser conservative dynamic asset allocation fund? How does it differ? Okay, so see... Reducing equity exposure when markets are risky, increasing it when valuations are more favorable, that's primarily how most of the funds are run, okay? So it's valuation-based. Managers can use P ratios, PB ratios, they can develop internal valuation models, and that determines the outcome of the ratio of equity to debt. But because this is a no-holds-barred category, SEBI actually allows you to go from zero to 100%, and there, there is a lot of scope for innovation and differentiation. Let me give you an example. There could be another school of thought which says, let me run the scheme and be even more dynamic. Let's position the fund in such a way that when markets are going up and markets are favorable, we will be aggressively in equity. And when markets are falling, we can get aggressively out of equity as well. So you want to try and add value by asset allocation. 
Now, with such aggressive posturing, why close to Nifty returns? You might be able to get significantly higher than Nifty returns. Of course, there's a flip side as well, that if the fund manager gets the call wrong, you can be underperforming significantly for periods of time also. But it gives newer AMCs, especially or smaller AMCs, a chance to make a mark and deliver outperformance. And you know, if you deliver outperformance, you are going to attract more money. Apart from this, also advances in techniques, so many different inputs now that are going into models. So it really is a hotbed of differentiation. And I think it's great for investors who want to invest in this category. Okay, so I want a little more clarification on that because we mm. spoke about it being used interchangeably at times, right? So you are here distinguishing between balanced advantage funds, which tends to be more conservative, and dynamic asset allocation funds, which are more dynamic. In that case, does it mean one is better than the other? How can one uh, differentiate here? See, unfortunately, the nomenclature doesn't work that way. You have some DAF funds, which are also run quite conservatively. But let me give you a couple of examples, okay? Typically, one of the larger funds is ICICI. They follow a valuation-driven approach, which means that when valuations are high, they lower their equity exposure and vice versa. And we've seen in the last maybe around six months, their net equity exposure has only been between 35 and 40%. So they've been significantly underperforming the Nifty, if you were to look at it that way. You have another fund like Edelweiss. Now, Edelweiss follows a different approach, not a valuation-driven approach. They look at daily moving averages, and they believe in a trend-following approach. So if there is an upward trend in the market, they tend to increase their equity exposure. If the trend is going the other way, they lower their equity exposure. So in the same period where a conservative or a traditional BAP might have been in the 40% region, Edelweiss was probably in the 60 to 70% range. Mm -hmm. And then you have newer AMCs, a quant AMC or a Samco AMC. At the same time, they've kept their equity exposure at 80% and even 90%. So, you know, there's a big variance in terms of equity exposure across various funds. And this exposure or this aggression is not just limited in terms of what your equity exposure can be. There's even variation against caps. What I mean by that is the average seems to be that if a fund has, let's say, a 50% equity exposure, 70 to 75% of it is large caps. Okay. But now you have some other funds like HSBC or Motilal or 361, over 50% of their equity exposure has been in mid caps and small caps. So, you know, there is going to be quite a lot of outperformance and underperformance, and you must really understand all these dynamics before you pick and invest in a balanced advantage fund. Okay, of course, we would consider a lot of things. So, in that case, Kushal, would there be any recommendation uh, in terms of balanced advantage funds where an investor can invest? See, I'm of the school of thought that there's no bad scheme, okay? Let me just put out that way. They're all being managed by very professional people and by very pedigreed AMCs. I think what we must understand is that every AMC will have a different approach that the fund managers are going to take, and therefore your experience in the short term especially can be very different. At times, you will have valuation fund based funds which are doing better than momentum. Sometimes it will be the other way around. At times, you will have large caps doing better than mid caps and small caps. So, you know, you are going to have a period where some funds are underperforming and over outperforming and sort of taking turns in that. So I don't think it's the fact that one fund is better than the other. I think, as I mentioned earlier in the show, the behavior of the fund must work consistently according to the stated design. Okay, so you must be mindful of the design that you're comfortable with, whether it actually matches your investment objectives, because that's the only way that you can ensure that these selected funds will be successful for you and you can remain invested even through the downtimes because you understand why the funds are underperforming for certain periods of time. So, you know, if you are investing through an MFD or an advisor, they typically will be able to help you out with this. If you are, on the other hand, investing in direct plans, then there is some amount of homework that you have to do before you go and invest in these kinds of funds. Homework is always important when it is about your money. So definitely that's a sane advice. But are there any disadvantages or risks that you see around balanced advantage funds that you want our viewers to be aware of? I don't know about disadvantages. I think one criticism which can come from some ends is that perhaps these funds are slightly more expensive. And especially if we compare them to passive funds, right? Because passive funds, your index and ETFs will obviously be cheaper. Balanced Advantage Fund is an active fund, and there is a fair amount of work that the fund management team is doing to be active in this front. And if you compare the expense ratios of BAF funds with other active funds, then there isn't much of a difference, actually. So, no, I don't see any serious criticism with this category. It's just that if you are investing in a BAF, you have to choose and select one 
that is appropriate and in line with your investment objectives. Okay, so there's no one uh, bigger risk, so to say, with this particular scheme. But of course, you have to align it with your risk profile and the overall com uh, uh, contribution that you made to the scheme as well. Uh, Kushal, it was such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining in and Thank taking you. us through this deep dive into Bank's Advantage Funds. Very interesting category and we've seen a lot of ups and downs here as well. So thanks a lot for your time today. Okay, with that, uh, let's move on and talk about the mutual fund data. We just got it a while back and uh, there have been some big changes that we've seen on a month-on-month -month basis, definitely. Let's talk first up about the equity flows that we've seen overall. They have come in at 38,212 crore rupees, which is a slight uptick on a month-on-month -month basis. It has come off, of course, from the June levels. That was a big number. We saw a massive rally in equities in June as well, post-elections. Now to the big number, and that's the large cap funds. That is where you saw an inflow of 2,636.9 crore rupees. And as you can see, it has been anywhere on a monthly basis between 600 to uh, 700 crore rupees. June was higher at 970. But it has been on the lower side last year when large caps were seeing outflows and mid and small caps were doing well. So this has made a massive comeback in the month of August. And that's point number one, which stood out for me in this month's uh, numbers. Uh, the second thing is that while large caps have done well, we were talking about these higher valuations for small and mid caps, even they have done well. So small caps on a month-on-month -month basis have seen an increase to 3,209 crore rupees. This is again at a multi-month high. Similar is the story for mid-caps as well. So mid-caps have seen doubling of inflows on a month-on-month -month basis. They have come at 3,054 crore rupees, which compares with 1,644 crore rupees. We were talking about balanced advantage funds and you know, generally the hybrid category, which has done really well in the past couple of months when there were outflows in debt funds, there were outflows in large cap funds, so this category picked up. In July as well, it garnered decent amount at 17,436 crore rupees, but now that has come off sharply to 10,005 crore rupees. So hybrids did not do so well. Sector and thematic, that continues to be the big theme. You know, now it has seen uh, funds of around, flows of around 18,117 crore rupees, flattish on a month-on-month -month basis, but from highs of the month of June, June, it has come off substantially. Uh, this is about sector and thematic funds. Let's talk about the SIP number again at a record high. It's at 23,547 crore rupees, inching closer to the 24,000 crore mark. But of course, we need to understand these are the gross SIP numbers, right? So we need to understand the net SIP numbers because the gross, uh, net SIP has been lower. In fact, there was a 50% differential that we saw earlier in the month of June. We'll have to see if that has continued or not. That is the SIP number. And while we talk about uh, the SIP number and the inflow number, we also have to talk about new, flund, uh, new fund offers or the NFOs. Net inflows have ebbed to 13,815 crore rupees and that compares with a number of around uh, 16,565 crore rupees but remember there were more NFOs in the month of August 18 NFOs which compares with around 15 NFOs that we saw in the month of July so that is largely the picture large caps have made a massive comeback sectoral and NFOs remain at similar levels even mid and small caps have done really well and that's what the data suggests this time around as far as the mutual fund data for the month of August is concerned. Well, with that, we'll take your leave on this edition of MF Corner, but stay tuned for Closing Bell to take you through the last hour of trade.